Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this early. Uh, that shows dedication to our workshop. It's workshop 17, Cell Biology of the Airway Epithelium. So if anybody didn't want to attend this one, please go now. Uh, but thank you all for coming. We have a, my name is Estelle Komeboyaka. Uh, I'm at the Ohio State University and I will be co-chairing this session with uh, my colleague Esther Vladar, who is from the University of Colorado. Uh, just as a reminder, every speaker will uh, present for about 15 minutes. That will be followed by five minute questions. So if you have a question, please come right after the talk and use the microphone because this is also live. Um, I think uh, let's get started. Uh, yes, and one last thing, uh, we all brought a dear friend with us. If we could silence it for the next two hours, um, as a respect for the speakers, that would be great. Thank you. So let's get started. Our first speaker is, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alessandra Livraghi Butrico from UNC Chapel Hill. And she will present about the influence of postnatal lung development and host microbiota on the neonatal airway mucus clearance system. Alessandra, welcome. It's yeah, okay. How do we exit? I guess we need to use that. Okay. Okay, yeah. Just making sure the laser pointer works there. Good morning, everybody. And um, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me here to present some of the work that we've done in, in my lab. Um, this is the list of my collaborator and the people who helped me with this uh, uh, project and my funding sources. So let's, and I have nothing to disclose. Um, so let's get uh, started. So it is well accepted that the early postnatal period represents a critical window of susceptibility for uh, several respiratory diseases, both of a genetic, environmental, or infectious um, origin. So in our lab, we have several examples of uh, mouse models that have defective mucus clearance, and they all exhibit early, spontaneous bacterial infection in their lungs. So one example is here is our beta inactive transgenic mouse. This mouse doesn't have good uh, mucus clearance because of hyperabsorption of sodium and the uh, airway surface dehydration. And you can see here, if we play the BAL um, on, on blood agar, we can see bacteria growing in mice that are between five and 12 days of age. The same thing happens for MAC5B knockout mice, where a great proportion of mice exhibits bacterial growth when they are young. So this, of course, could be attributed to the well-documented immaturity of the immune system during the postnatal age. However, we were wondering, uh, does mucus and mucus clearance have anything to do with this? And so our reasoning stems from two observations that we had. So the first one is that the early postnatal airway landscape is very dynamic. So we and others have described that there is a temporal and spatial pattern of abundance of air, um, ABPAS positive cells, which we'll call mucus secretory cells. Uh, across the, the airways of a young animal. So you can see here, this, there is a, like a wave of these ABPS positive cells that starts in the trachea at day five, around day five, and then around day 10, it moves to the proximal portion of the main stem bronchus, and then progressively wanes. So after five weeks, uh, six weeks, when the mouse becomes an adult, you don't see this ABPS positive cells. So think about it as a wave. And uh, so, the second um, observation that we had is that these waves seem to be aggravated if you grow mice in germ-free environment. And I want to stress the fact that these mice are all wild type. They are naive, they're not challenged. So you can see here when we do evaluation of the mucus volume density in the airways of these mice, this is what we see in the SPF uh, raised mice. So this is just standard um, rearing. And uh, in germ-free mice, we see more of these uh, goblet cells. So this suggests that the neonatal mucus clearance system uh, responds in a unique way 
to the stimuli that can come, you know, they can be intrinsic or extrinsic. So how do we study this problem? It's a moving target, right? So the option of grinding up the whole lung is not an option for these studies. So we needed, you know, a more refined approach. So we modify the protocol that was initially described in the lab of Dr. Plopper, in which you uh, take the lungs, put them in RNA later, and I know many of you are familiar with this reagent. It's a concentrated solution of ammonium sulfate. If you study biochemistry, you know that high salt precipitate proteins preserve in the RNA. So that's how RNA later works. But it also works to fix the lungs. So it gives them enough consistency that we can then carve out and micro dissect different portion of the lungs. So you can get the submucosa glands, trachea, bronchi, and little slivers of parenchyma around, around the pleural border. So if we collected these samples from mice, wild type and beta inac mice at two different ages, day 10 and uh, postnatal day 56. So they are either pups or adults, and that's how I'm going to refer to them. And as you can see here in this piece, and then we perform uh, bulk RNA sequencing. You can see here in this PCA plot that we got a pretty good separation, both for ages. So all the pups are up here and all the adults are down here. And the PCA1 is actually different tissue. So we have good separation across tissues or compartments and good separation of, with, with ages. And as you can imagine, this kind of analysis brings up a lot of data and we can get lost in there. But all I want to show you or point to your attention to today is that we can <clears throat> analyze this data by looking at the genotype driven differential expressed genes. And so you can see here that so on this side are the ones that are upregulated in beta inac mice. So at day 10, there is not really much going on except for in the bronchi. And uh, this difference gets amplified when the mice are older. And you can see that now the signature of disease, they start showing up in the submucosa glands, in the trachea and in the parenchyma. As far as age-driven DEG, uh, there is one common observation across all the organs, all the, all the organs, all the compartments that we studied. Um, so although the, the genes per se, that are uh, different between young and old mice, are the same between wild type and beta inac mice, the magnitude of their changes is much smaller in the beta inac mice. So you can see here, this is the log fold change expression. The, in the wild type, this is much broader than in the beta inac mice, suggesting that the beta inac mice have some kind of developmental delay. Okay, so focusing on uh, the genes of interest, so we're talking about mucus, and so we have to look at mucins. And uh, so this is, <coughs> expression pattern for MAC5B and 5AC uh, along, you know, across the different compartments in wild type and beta inac at two different ages, males and females. So you can, you can see the complete picture here. And what we notice is that at day 10, both in the trachea and the bronchi, transcription of MAC5AC was significantly increased compared to um, wild type. So MAC5AC seems to be the the, the reason why that ABPS staining was going up. So we confirmed this by Agaro's Western blot of mucin. So we, we perform a, a mucin Western blot on the bronchoviral lavage from these animals. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see here, we had two different patterns for MAC5B and MAC5AC. So for 5B, uh, of course, at both ages, the beta inac mice had more MAC5B compared to the wild type. And MAC5B was accumulating as the mouse was getting old. Now, it's important to know that these numbers are normalized per volume of BAR retrieved, because of course the volume between the two animals, two ages is very different. So MAC5B accumulates in the airways of the, of the mice. And uh, however, MAC5AC was different already a baseline in the wild type mice. We have more 5AC in the young wild type mice as compared to the adult ones. And this is about, it's, it's almost true also for the beta inac mice. The 5AC does not go up. Whatever MAC5AC is uh, depositing in the airways at young age, it seems to stay there forever and is not clear in beta inac mice. So let's go back to our problem of the germ-free mice. So now we know that this little blip in ABPAS is probably due to an increase in 5AC. 
So how about this? Um, now, germ-free mice are a wonderful resource, but they're a little bit far away from reality, right? Nobody lives in a bubble. And so we wonder if we could apply this paradigm and these studies by applying a, um, a maneuver that would change the host microbiota in a similar way, but it would be more tractable. And so we use a protocol that was used in the lab of Itesh Deshmuk in Cincinnati, and we perform a, a perinatal antibiotic administration, which means giving a cocktail, a mega cocktail of antibiotic to the dams from E15, so embryonic day 15, to postnatal day 12. At postnatal day 12, we harvest the mice and both the pups and the dams, and we, we look at histology and uh, we perform the micro dissected um, RNA later lung analysis. So this is what we found as expected. Treatment with antibiotic decreases the abundance of 16S um, the, uh, the copy genes in the, in the treated mice, both in pups and in the dams, which is only two of them. So, um, unexpectedly, this treatment also cause the beta inac mice to die more readily. So increases mortality in the beta inac pups. So this is the normal expected mortality for this strain. And, but if you uh, give them antibiotic perinatally, they die more uh, readily. However, when we looked at the mucus volume density, this was not changed, or at least it wasn't changed in the mice that survived to day 12. So we really don't have a, a, a clear grasp of what happened to these mice here early on, if they actually died for because of mucus obstruction. We have some preliminary data that I have in the poster. I don't have them here. So if you want to know a little bit more of where we're going with this, come by the poster later on. Um, we have a bigger problem, though. All these mouse studies are interesting. I mean, no, no question. But does this happen in humans? This is the key question, right? So what? So to tackle this problem, we decided to study mucus that is uh, stuck to endotracheal tubes where, that are used to develop to deliver anesthesia during surgery. And so our inclusion criteria for these studies was very simple. You know, in the first cohort. We just recruited um, individuals that are zero to four years old, so all kids. They don't have to, uh, no history of lung disease uh, and no current upper respiratory tract infection. So these are healthy children. Um, and then the tip of the endotracheal tube is just dropped into urea, immediately solubilized and subjected to mass spectrometry. So what we found is that all samples, most samples have some mucins in there. And when we look at the ratio between 5AC and 5B, uh, we see that a lot of samples are scattered above this dotted line, which represents the average ratio between 5AC and 5B that we find in healthy adult sputum. Now, ETT mucus is different from sputum and everything else, but in general, um, 5AC and 5B are a ratio at a 10 to 1. So it suggests that kids might have a little bit more um, 5AC. The real surprise came when we did the uh, unlabel-free unlab proteomic analysis of these samples. And uh, when you do unsupervised clustering, you can find three clusters that are vaguely organized depending on age. So we have uh, especially this big cluster here is, the, is uh, for younger kids. And then you have these two clusters that are for older kids suggesting that there is something that influences, that is age dependent in the expression of the proteins in these samples. Now, this could be totally due to the fact that the smaller kits have smaller airways and the, and the endotracheal tube goes in and wrecks havoc way more in the little kids than in the older ones. So without knowing anything else, we were kind of stuck. So we went back to the drawing board and now we designed the study to collect samples from a wider range of kids. So and now we are from zero to 16. Same thing, same, these are healthy kids, no history of lung disease, no current uh, uh, respiratory infection. And, uh, but instead of collecting the samples in urea, we collect them in lactate ringer so that we can actually count the cells. We can see which kind of cells do they have. And uh, we have uh, a little bit more information about the samples when we throw it in the mass spectrometer. 
And so this is, you know, the, the, the proteomic analysis of this sample is ongoing, so I don't have anything to show you. But I have, what I have to show is that like what we found um, with, the, with the cell count. So there is quite a bit of cells in those samples. And, uh, you know, they're, they're varied, they're with different viability. We're actually exploring uh, the possibility of using these cells to do single cell analysis and see actually what, what is in there and use this sample as a way to probe the healthy um, airway environment in humans. In parallel, we're also conducting this uh, histological analysis on pediatric uh, lung samples. So we get these samples in collaboration with Scott Randell and the Marsico Lung Institute Tissue Procurement Corps. Uh, so these are samples from lungs that are rejected for transplant. And we try to sample them in a way that it's a, they, they capture a good representation of large and small airways. And then based on their morphology, we categorize their airways in uh, segmental bronchi, distal bronchi, or proximal descent terminal bronchioles. Um, then we, at this point, we only done um, morphologic analysis for uh, the mucus volume density. And I have only, you know, these three uh, children. One is three, day old, three years old, nine years old, and 12 years old. And, um, and then we compare with data that come from the Okuda lab in, at UNC, where it can describe the distribution of APPS stain and mucin in healthy adult lungs. And you can see here, so the adults are here in purple and our three children are up here. You can see that for every generation of airways, there seem to be more ABPS staining in the children as compared to the adults. So this kind of suggests that what we're seeing in mice is also true in humans. So if you have two things to take home today, the first one is that age-dependent changes in airway mucus composition are observed in mice and humans. So baby mucus is not the same as adult mucus. And possibly perinatal depletion of host microbiota might exacerbate airway mucus obstructive phenotypes, which is extremely relevant for our CF um, patient population. And with that, I just take questions. Thank you very much. The floor is now open for questions. Please come to the microphone if you have a question for our speaker. Okay, so then I'll start us off with a question or would you please go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, hi, Ali. I mean, I think it's super interesting that there is this developmental, this potential for developmental delay when you have a mucus obstruction phenotype. Um, and, you know, in the context of all of the new information that we have about repair and, you know, how the lung responds to disease in terms of repair, is that something you're going to be paying attention to? as you go forward, because it seems really relevant and interesting. If, if you have a disease as a child, your lung is not going to develop the same as if you didn't. Yes, and it's, it's true that there are pathways that the lung has put in place as it develops to, you know, remodel and get to the final shape. And some of those pathways are the same that occur during remodeling after injury later on. So of course it would be interesting to know what those pathways are to see if we can, you know, revive them at the right time during later on disease. But that is, you know, that's something that, yeah, we're definitely gonna look into. And I think it, it is known somehow that having early inflammatory responses in the lung somewhat stops your proper development. I don't know, I'm not, um, I haven't read enough into that, but I don't know if anybody, I know our pediatricians. Hi, uh, this is Wen Jianru from University of Iowa. I have a question about uh, the mucus uh, in the young and the old mice or human. I'm wondering what's your speculation why in young animals or kids there are more mucus in those areas? 
Yes. So I do have an hypothesis. So um, I think that as you are developing, you want to rely more on uh, your innate immune system, which is less likely to provoke like a very strong inflammatory response. I think that is what is um, known in both humans and mice. The TH2, um, the, the immune system in postnatal life is TH2 skewed. So if you think about TH2 responses, they're more protective, they're more, they're less inflammatory, there's like less inflaming. And that to me makes sense because uh, you need to put them in place when you are actually still developing some structure. Think about alveolization, think about, you know, still getting in the lung in the proper shapes. So you don't, you don't want to throw a bomb in and, and overreact to something that might not be as detrimental as you think, just because it's the first time you see it, you know, a, a challenge. That That's my hypothesis. Yeah, thank you. We'll see. Very nice talk, Ali. I was really intrigued about the observations that antibiotic treatment is later on so detrimental to the offspring. And first of all, I wonder whether there could be a retrospective uh, study be done, like there must be data available, right, on pregnant women that took antibiotics. But the main question is, what is the mechanism? I mean, you kind of indicated that the microbiota might be affected, but do you think that then the microbiota might affect immunity and host defense, or what is the mechanism to that? That's exactly the case. So there is a huge amount of work that is done in the in the lab of uh, Dr. Deshmuk in Cincinnati, when he shows that not having the right bacteria in the gut prevents uh, the influx of this ILC3, IL22 positive cells into the lung. And uh, if you don't have this transient influx of, of these cells, you are way more susceptible to experimental uh, infection. So those cells go transiently into the lung and somehow instruct the local immunity to be ready to be, you know, reactive to bacteria that might come in. And if you don't have that, you get, um, you, you, you die, really, you know, at, at, at day four, the little pups, if they don't have it. Okay. So, you know, I, my interest was to look into if, if there is a, a, a mucus dependent component in this uh, immune response. And, you know, it, again, it could be totally due to immune cells, but we know that the two components of immunity, they often work together. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, just the last thing you mentioned, a poster. Can you? Yes, which? 158. What? 158. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so moving on, um, I would like to ask Anne Marie Colley from um, UNC Chapel Hill to come up on the podium. She will be talking to us about distal airway secretory cells. So, Emory, come on up here. So, hit right there. Hit start. Start to type. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Amory Colley. I'm a research technician in Kenichi Okuda's lab at UNC Chapel Hill in the Marsco Lung Institute. And I'll be presenting on how SEGB3A2 positive distal airway secretory cells are a therapeutic target for CFTR function restoration. And I have nothing to disclose. So first, when we think about the cellular target of CFTR gene therapy, we want to target cells that normally express CFTR. The most efficient and safest targets for CFTR function restoration should be cells that normally express CFTR. And so it's fundamentally important for us to understand which cell types normally express it and how that changes in CF. To determine which cell type normally expresses CFTR, we integrated data from 49 single cell RNA sequencing data sets 
and we concluded that multiple cell types express CFDR. Particularly ionocytes, small and large airway secretory cells, and basal cells. When we look at the relative frequency of expression, secretory cells have the highest relative CFTR expression due to their abundance. This is some data from John Englehart's lab at the University of Iowa, and it shows very proximal lungs, and it highlights the importance of ionocytes for CFTR expression and function, specifically in the small airway or in the proximal airways. And it shows that CFTR mRNAs were 50% down in FOX I1 knockout ferrets, and there was greater than a 50% reduction in CFTR function in the ferret tracheal explant data, which proves that ionocytes are important in the proximal lung CFTR function. IHC data highlights the distribution of ionocytes in proximal ferret lung, and the proximal trachea shows an even distribution of ionocytes and in the secondary bronchus of ionocytes cluster to the submucosal glands. And this is consistent with our previous human data and newborn pig data. And this suggests that ionocyte function in the distal airways should be um, investigated further. So this figure illustrates the branching structure of the lung and the distribution of ionocytes in the large and small airways. RNA scope images show the amount of positive CFTR how the amount of positive CFTR stained airway stays relatively consistent from the main bronchi to the terminal bronchioles. However, the number of ionocytes decreases drastically as you move from the large airways to the small airways. And these findings are further illustrated in the quantification of RNA scope signals, looking at the CFTR positive area and the number of positive ionocytes in each lung section. CFTR expression does not change significantly between large and small airways, but the number of FOX I1 positive cells decreases. And newborn pig data reiterates the decline of ionocytes in the small airways, and this is recapitulated in single cell RNA sequencing. The conclusion we drew from this is that another cell type may be important for CFTR expression, specifically in the small airways. Next, I'm going to show you the human airway structure. So human airways are branched 23 times to connect to the alveoli. And when we classify large and small airways, the classic definition is that small airways are any airway with diameter less than two millimeters. So we will be using small airways and distal airways interchangeably throughout the presentation. Um, some structural differences are also shown here um, between the large and small. So cartilage and submucosal glands are only present in the large airways. Another important feature of this lung structure is that con uh, small airways constitute the majority of airway surface area due to the exponential increase in surface area from the branching structure. So they have 98.4% of the total surface area of the lung, and they're understudied overall, so we'll focus specifically on them. Three papers have previously described the differences in the small and large airway epithelial cells and as recently reported in single cell based studies, the small airway epithelia express unique markers such as SFTPB and SCGP3A2 and are distinct from large airway epithelial cell populations. This difference is particularly highlighted in secretory cell populations and may contribute to differential mucociliary clearance mechanisms between large and small airways and is shown in our um, IHC data. We have developed in vitro primary human cell, human small airway epithelial cell culture models called SAE cultures. And as presented last year by our group, we tested two methods to isolate the small airway epithelial cells from the transplant donor lungs, their microdissection and bulk enzymatic digestion. We expanded the isolated small airway cells and cultured them in ALI in identical conditions to large airway cultures. Both small airway cell isolation methods provide differentiated small airway cultures, expressing the small airway markers SFTPB and SCGP3A2. The advantage of bulk, di of bulk digestion is that we can isolate small airway epithelial cells um, from diseased lungs where they're like CF, where small airways are very difficult to be microdissected. Micro so ultimately, our small airway cell cultures express the same markers as are seen in vivo. Uh, 
Uh, we performed single cell RNA sequencing on cultured in vitro large and small airway cells. We multiplied the CFTR expression levels by the number of cells to get the contribution of total CFTR expression. These data show how secretory cells in general contribute a large amount to overall CFTR expression, especially in the small airways. And we highlighted here how CFTR expression is more highly enriched in the secretory cell populations. So the two secretory cell markers that we show are SCGB3A2 and SCGB1A1, with SCGB3A2 being specific to small airway secretory cells. And RNA scope data illustrates that the SCGB3A2 positive cells also express CFTR. We then created lentiviral vectors that contained SCGB3A2 promoter driving GFP, and we administered these to human large and small airway epithelial cell cultures. SCGB3A2 GFP transduced cells were then sorted by fluorescence activated cell sorting or FAC sorting, and QRT PCR was performed on the GFP positive and negative sorted cells. Last year, we presented on SCGB1A1, so today we're going to show the differences between SCGB1A1 and SCGB3A2 promoters driving GFP. Um, and ultimately, we can confirm that SCGB3A2 promoter is more specific to the small airways. RNA scope data shows that the SCGB3A2 promoter is more specific as well because um, you can see the co-localization of SCGB3A2 and GFP only in the small airways. So here is the qPCR data, RT-qPCR data from the uh, sorted cells, and you can see that secretory cells are more prevalent in the GFP positive small and large airway cells, and CFTR expression is also higher specifically in the small airway GFP positive cells. While ionocytes are more so highly expressed in the GFP negative small airway cells. So the, CF, the heightened CFTR has to come from some other cell type is what we concluded. Our next step in that experiment is to test if the SCGB3A2 promoter can drive expression of functional CFTR specifically in the CF small airways. And this is analogous to what we have done previously with the SCGB1A1 promoter, driving expression of wild type CFTR in both the large and small airways. We replaced the GFP with wild type CFTR under the SCGB1A1 promoter to transduce wild type CFTR specifically in secretory cells. It's important to note that we infected SCGB1A1 driving wild type CFTR into CF large and small airways. We found that CFTR function was restored in both the large and small airway cultures where wild type CFTR was transduced. These data suggest that secretory cells are competent to express functional CFTR and can be a potential target for CFTR molecular therapies. Our next goal was to determine what controls the secretory cell phenotype in small airways, how is the secretory cell type maintained in normal lungs, and what is changed in CF. To answer the question of what is changed in CF, we performed GOMX spatial transcriptomics. And these data highlight the difference, the differential gene expression between normal and CF small airways. CF small airways show an increase in MUC5AC and MUC5B and a decrease in the two small airway markers, SFTPB and SCGB3A2. And both of these findings are indicative of goblet cell metaplasia. IHC data, shown here, also illustrates a decrease in the transcription factor NKX2.1 and the small airway markers SFTPB and SCGB3A2, positive area in the CF small airways. Therefore, these two markers correlate with NKX2.1, their upstream transcription factor. And we hypothesize here that NKX2.1 might regulate the distal airway secretory cell identity, and secretory cells might be gone in the CF small airways. 
We then knocked out NKX 2.1 in large and small airway cell cultures using CRISPR-Cas9. And for all of our codes tested, the K efficiency was greater than 90%. H&E histology sections portray the morphological differences between the control cultures and NKX 2.1 knockout cultures, particularly in the distal airways. Whole mount IHC data shows a striking increase in MUC 5 ac positive cells in the NKX 2.1 knockout small airway cultures. In contrast, SFTPV positive small airway secretory cells were significantly decreased. These data suggest that, N that NKX 2.1 knockout induces replacement of small airway secretory cells with MUC 5 ac positive goblet cells and recapitulates typical findings observed in small airways in mucoobstructive lung diseases. Our bulk RNA sequencing data more globally illustrates a shift of secretory cell phenotype from distal airway secretory cells to pathological goblet cells that produce mucins. There is an increase in goblet cell genes in the small airway knockout cultures, notably MUC5AC. And there is a decrease in small airway secretory cell genes in small airway knockout cultures, notably SFTPB. And CFTR expression decreases in the small airway NKX 2.1 knockout cultures, which also may reflect the loss of the small airway secretory cells. Um, also, it's, it's important to note that basal cells, ciliated cells, and ionocyte markers are not changed by the NKX 2.1 knockout in small airway cultures. Our next goal was to look at how the loss of secretory cell identity affects the small airways, particularly the small airway mucus. We found no significant change between the small airway negative guide and NKX 2.1 knockout in CFTR function. So that shows that CFTR function may be preserved in the goblet cells. However, MUC5B and MUC5AC are increased in the large and small airway NKX 2.1 knockout cultures, which is shown in the mucin western blot. And this also showed an increase in both MUC5AC and MUC5B in the large and small airway NKX 2.1 knockout cultures, but MUC5AC increased drastically in the small airway NKX 2.1 knockout. We then calculated the percent solid components of apical mucus from large and small normal lung cell cultures. The percent solid components of mucus are significantly increased in the small airway NKX 2.1 knockout cultures, but not in the large airway. So if this happens even in non-CF cultures, the mucin concentration increases. In CF cells, percent solids may increase even more. So ultimately, we can conclude that small airway secretory cells are a key cell type expressing CFTR and are competent to mediate corrected CFTR function. Small airway secretory cell identity is regulated by NKX 2.1 and loss of NKX 2.1 disrupts the secretory cell phenotype in the small airway epithelia. The loss of small airway secretory cell identity causes mucus hyperconcentration resulting in mucociliary clearance dysfunction in the small airway region, and restoration of the disrupted pathways regulating CFTR expressing small airway secretory cell homeostasis as a cell type competent for CFTR function will be a key strategy for successful molecular therapies. So ultimately, our opinion on potential cell types for CFTR gene therapy are that secretory cells are a high priority target Ionocytes are a great target in large airways, including the submucosal glands, but need more investigation in small airways, and we've recently begun studying them there. Basal cells are an appropriate target for gene therapy or gene editing, and ciliated cells or goblet cells are lower priority targets. And ultimately, just wanted to thank my PI and everyone in the Okuda and Boucher labs. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was fantastic. Um, please feel free to start with the first question. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, just for my, uh, you know, reflecting my ignorance, uh, 
what's the proportion of club cells mean your secretary cells are they one and the same or are the club cells a subset um i think they're all included in the same i'm pretty sure okay okay hi ian thornell university of iowa great talk um so is there any advantage or, or, or disadvantage in coming in with a ubiquitous promoter to hit all the cells since it seems like the ciliated cells are not competent to express the FCR? Um, I That is a great question. I am not exactly sure, but I think our main goal is just to focus on targeting the secretory cells as they are such a big target and kind of ex that way we know we're excluding other cell types like ionocytes and yeah all the ciliated cells, because ciliated cells, I guess, could potentially have very, very low expression, which could throw certain things off, but. Thanks, great work. Thank you. So Anne-Marie, do you think that it would be critical um, uh, prior to therapy to come up with potentially other other interventions that would normalize or kind of relieve the remodeling? So remove the excess um, goblet cells to allow more of these competent secretory cells to emerge for getting better therapeutic bang for your buck? Yeah, yeah. We're currently working on an overexpression of NKX 2.1 model, mm -hmm. which if you rescue that phenotype and then go in with the therapy, I think would probably hopefully be more efficient and effective form of therapy. Um, so yeah, I do think that that would be a good good thing to do. All right, thanks. Any other questions? We'll quickly check if we have any questions coming in from online. So we do have one question, which I'm going to read out. Um, this is from Feng Yuan. Um, uh, did CFTR gain a function in small airways, restore airway surface liquid volume in CF? Um, I, I am not exactly sure. Um, do you want to take a guess? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, I don't know. I don't really, what was the question? Uh, does CFTR gain a function in small airways, restore airway surface liquid volume in CF? So your rescue experiment. Um, in the scgb one a one cultures? Yeah. I will say that those cultures did have more diluted mucus, it looked like. So I would ultimately assume that the volume is more restored than the original. That's, That's what I noticed in the cell cultures. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank okay, you very much. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Esther Vladar, and she's going to talk about sinonasal epithelial responses to long-term highly effective CFTR modulator therapy. All right, how does that sound? Um, thank you everybody for um, uh, attending this session and um, uh, me giving myself the opportunity to talk to you about um, uh, our latest studies on sinonasal epithelial responses to long-term highly effective CFDR modulator therapy. I have no disclosures. And um, let's immediately get into the motivation behind our study and the long-standing interest in my lab which is to better understand um, the airway epithelial remodeling that characterizes the CF airways. And very simply, what I'm talking about are detrimental structural and functional changes represented, for example, on these scanning electron microscopy images of the sinonasal um, uh, mucosal surface, the beautiful shag carpet, maybe with a little bit of um, uh, snot here and healthy, and this extreme sort of focal and potentially episodic remodeling in the CF. These are all samples from a single
single donor um, containing sort of nearly normal ciliated cells and all these very angry goblet cells. So what we're trying to understand is, is how this comes about. Um, uh, are any of this potentially irreversible? Um, uh, and whether studying these features in the cyanonasal epithelium is a good way to learn about CF airway disease altogether. So very briefly, here's the model of how we think this type of airway epithelial remodeling happens. So we believe that this is secondary to um, CFTR dysfunction um, I do Due to sort of this vicious cycle of epithelial injury and maladaptive repair in the context of um, uh, chronic infection and inflammation. So um, within um, uh, our sort of adult cohorts of patients uh, with CF, the airway epithelium is in this remodeled dysfunctional state. And of course, it is 2023, which means most of these individuals are luckily are undergoing highly effective modulator therapy. And of course, the burning question is, is do we get this sought for restoration of normal structure and function of, or, or do we sort of go into this improved with persistent dysfunction state? And this is the question that we're trying to address with our study, which we have titled our kind of hemped versus healthy study. This is a, um, a single cell study coming from nasal brushes, which we obtained from adult samples, um, adult subjects, um, with established CF disease. So 10 subjects who've been on modulators for quite a long time with nine healthy aged matched controls. Um, the right nose goes for single cell sequencing, the left goes for primary culture, and we're going to not talk about that today. But going to um, I, our single cell data, I just wanted to very briefly show you our study demographics. So these are our CF subjects, um, uh, sexes and ages well matched to our controls, a variety of modulator compatible genotypes. Um, we vast majority of these folks were on ETI. We had one subject um, on long-term Ivacaftor have been responding clinically very well to Ivacaftor. And as you can see that with the exception of one person here who was on modulator for a short time and in fact actually hopped off of that modulator later right before our brush biopsy, we have sort of a long-term hemp response cohort. So these are the folks that we're going to be looking at at the single cell level. But before we get into that, I definitely want to highlight some really critical limitations and considerations. Obviously, the overlap of the pandemic with both our study as well as the rollout of ETI. Um, I, we're going to show you a uh, single time point observation. We do have, um, you you remember from um, presentations last year from um, I, by me that we have a sort of sister data set, which is a uh, bulk transcriptomic time course of ETI response over time. Um, we've been doing a lot of comparisons between these two data sets. Of course, there are undeniable advantages of nasal brushings, and hopefully everybody is a believer in the unified airway as we're trying to make conclusions from these data um, uh, to the rest of the airway tree. And then, of course, as a cell biologist, I have to throw it out there that um, transcriptomics is just a hypothesis generating tool. And what we're hoping to do is um, uh, learn a lot from these data as a foundation for experiments in years to come. So let's dive directly into what we found in the noses of these healthy and CF plus hemped donors. So what you're looking at over here is the standard UMAP projection of the mostly epithelial but also immune cells. If anybody wants to know how to get neutrophils in single cell, we paid a big price for it. So let me know if you want to know more about it. So we have um, about a um, 160,000 cells, a good balance um, between the healthy and the CF. We have all the expected epithelial cell types, basal, secretory, ciliated, rare, which includes um, the ionocytes and a big population of squamous cells that we're going to revisit, as well as a variety of immune cells that we're unfortunately going to put, us, put aside for the sake of this talk. Um, this uh, bubble plot just shows that everybody checks out with the canonical markers of these cell types. 
So looking at um, uh, first at cellular composition and compositional changes between what is contributed to the data set from healthy and CF. So on this table, you can see the list of all the clusters that we've identified. Um, I, and what I've highlighted here um, in blue are the clusters where um, there are sort of more cells proportionally in the healthy, and the red is where there's more cells proportionally in CF. And not surprisingly, there is sort of an excess of these mucus secretory, especially the MUC5AC flavor, squamous cells, as well as remaining um, uh, an overrepresentation in neutrophils, although not all of these were statistically significant, and these types of data are generally pretty tricky to glean from single cell due to various technical issues. Now, when we get into molecular programming, we asked um, uh, what were sort of the number of up versus down regulated or less or more enriched genes in healthy NCF. And you can see that there are substantial gene expression changes affecting um, all of the clusters, although every once in a while we see clusters like these deuterosomal or the immature ciliated cells that just took a big dive um, in the CF um, uh, cells in terms of their gene expression. And so obviously we've been doing a lot to digest what these gene expression changes are. And so we're going to be getting into that for the rest of the talk. Um, but before we do, I want to take sort of an obligatory um, uh, detour and look at CFTR expression and localization um, uh, as it relates to our study. So in these projections, um, we split apart healthy and CF and overlapped um, CFTR gene positivity on the cells um, within the data set. And this is obviously not a surprise in light of what we just heard today or what we've been hearing for quite a long time. Um, the most number or the, the cell cluster that expressed the highest amount of CFTR, or in this case, have the most number of CFTR positive cells are um, um, the ionocytes that are hiding within this rare cell cluster. Um, second only um, are these various mucus secretory cells and a little bit the basal cells within it. Obviously, it's a little bit dicey to glean a very clean um, understanding of CFTR expression from single cell data. But the bottom line is, is that when we compare healthy versus CF that has been subject to modulator treatment, we didn't really see major expression um, differences with CFTR um, uh, gene expression. However, we did took a quick peek at this um, uh, with some tissue samples that we were able to collect from healthy donors, CF donors without modulators, and then CF donors that were on modulators. And this um, sort of apical CFDR staining, which we're able to do very consistently thanks to um, the CFDR antibody 596 from UNC, which is a, a wonderful resource, you can see that that um, upon restoration of CFTR with um, ETI, we can see a lot more um, uh, CFTR expression in the cells, although not all of it is at the surface. Most of it still remains, at least in this sample or many of the samples that we've looked at within the cytoplasm. All right. So now moving on to um, the molecular programming that differentiate the cells that um, come from healthy versus CF under um, ETI into our data set. And we've spent a lot of time analyzing both shared or core responses as opposed to individual responses. And probably the biggest finding that we've had from this study relate to a core pro-inflammatory response, which we established as follows. So we limited ourselves to the epithelial cells in the cluster, and we looked at what are the genes that just keep copying, coming up in each of these clusters. Um, and what we found is that um, a core um, a set of 65 genes that were always upregulated always upregulated in response to CF status in at least eight of the epithelial clusters. 
And when we carried out pathway analysis, we found that these terms speak to sort of this very classic CF-like neutrophilic inflammation that we have understood through the work of many people, including those in this audience, um, to characterize um, CF airway disease. So terms like neutrophilic deglanulation and a variety of terms related to inflammatory signaling and immune cell activation. So genes like IL-8, SLPI, S100, family genes, as well as several um, uh, factors related to ion transport. So this is a major signature that is shared by essentially all of the epithelial cells which respond um, uh, through this shared cassette of inflammatory um, mediators. So one of the things that we were really motivated to understand is how does our CF plus hemp cyanonasal um, epithelial data set compares to um, a wonderful data set that's been out there now for a little while from the Gombert Strip labs and the CFF, um, where single cell sequencing was used to compare healthy versus CF end stage um, uh, bronchial epithelium. Um, uh, this is sort of a without modulator data set. So what we did here in, in gray is um, the differentially expressed genes in CF in each one of these um, uh, cell type categories. The sort of orange pink are coming from our data set. And then we looked at pathway analysis um, uh, in the considerable overlap that we found between these data sets. And what we were able to see for the most part is again, the same genes that constitute this core pro-inflammatory response as and in addition to some of the cell type specific um, uh, pathways related to their misregulation, including this absolute winner of an annotation here called defective CFTR causes cystic fibrosis within the secret Cell. So we're getting to the point where this inflammatory signature is still present despite modulators and it is still um, uh, seen within um, the bronchial and stage lungs. And in the last couple minutes, I want to finish by talking about um, uh, a specific cell type um, related response, um, focusing on squamous cells, but the story starts with the basal cells themselves. So what you can see here are, are a variety of basal cell clusters, resting, differentiating, proliferating basal cells. And through um, across the board, almost exclusively, we see fewer basal cells in our data set in CF. We don't quite know what this means. But what we found when we carried out pathway analysis comparing the genes that are differentiating healthy versus CF basal cells is what we interpret as a uh, precocious activation of mucus secretory and squamous programs. So um, squamous genes um, such as the cytokeratins, members of the major epidermal differentiation complex are turned on in basal cells, as well as MUC5AC, and then this machinery that is, supports, um, that is supporting mucin processing um, uh, and secretion. And I want to highlight that um, we believe that this finding is similar to what was reported by um, uh, Wang et al. in their recent issue of the Blue Journal, an excellent study where they derived mucus and squamous differentiation primed basal cells clones for CF, and these may have a major impact on remodeling phenotypes within the airway epithelium. So very briefly, um, uh, we became interested in these squamous cells. Um, these are cells which we can find within the airway epithelium in sort of rare five to 50 cell diameter patches. They're interspersed between columnar epithelium, as you can see here, some ciliated cells. And notably, they are about five times as more abundant in CF as opposed to healthy. These cells are interesting to us um, because they carry um, a major burden of senescence as well as a unique and large number of inflammatory um, uh, gene expression um, uh, cassettes. 
And so a lot of the studies that we have in the lab right now are aimed at understanding what makes CF um, squamous cells different. Um, we can definitely see that they have higher expression of inflammatory components as well as altered metabolic programming. Um, but we have multiple studies still going on in the lab to understand more about these cells and what their role um, is in the airway. But very briefly, just to reinforce what I showed to you about the precocious activation of a squamous program within the stem cell population, we carried out trajectory analysis and focusing on the lineage that is towards the differentiation of squamous cells. Um, we looked at gene expression compa comparing healthy versus CF along pseudotime. And you can see that very on early, the expression of this epidermal differentiation complex related proteins, suggesting that this squamous programming is already initiated at the basal cell stage. And these data together support a picture where the CF cyanonasal epithelium remains remodeled and primed for remodeling despite modulator therapy. So in sum, our data adds to this emerging picture from many other studies that we've heard at this meeting so far that um, uh, paints the sort of improved but not cured picture when it comes to modulators um, in folks with established CF disease. And we're hoping to continue both the longitudinal sampling and an aggressive and rigorous comparison of the cyanonasal versus bronchial airways. Um, uh, and I would like to finish by acknowledging my collaborators, Katie Heisert and Max Seibold from National Jewish Austin Gillen from the university, as well as several fantastic bioinformaticians and folks from my lab. And then I'm going to end on a shameless plug of a beautiful ciliated epithelium and a, an invitation to apply for postdoc positions in the lab. Any questions from the audience? Please come to the microphone. Hi, Esther. Viral from MGH. Really fascinating work. The squamous metaplasia is really interesting. Um, would you think it's leftover injury response or scar or something else from the C in the CF airways? So I think that this is um, uh, sort of where the jury is out. Um, I, you know, initially I kind of thought of them as potentially bad actors that don't contribute much other um, uh, than barrier function, certainly not mucociliary clearance, and they're just, you know, secreting all the SASP. Um, but I think that we need to be a lot more flexible in our view because potentially um, uh, there's some data suggesting that they may be reversible over time. Um, I, we're essentially at the point where we've convinced ourselves that these are not skin cells that we pulled out of the nose <laughs> and that we can actually see um, uh, these stretches of squamous epithelium and we're hoping to study them over time. Gotcha. So maybe more than just dead zones of mucosary transport, maybe something else. Yeah. Potentially. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Great work. Hi, Esther. Great huh? talk. So why is it that if there is so much of an immune component, it doesn't lead to fibrosis, but this angry goblet cell phenotype that, that you mentioned? Why is it that there is no more fibrosis, especially if you see TGF beta in there? So I think that um, I probably a lot of factors go into actually completing maybe what you're getting at as a sort of full EMT transition. One thing that we did notice with these squamous cells, this has also been described before, that um, they potentially complete like a partial EMT process. Um, uh, that may be supporting this flattened morphology. Um, I, but probably it's a complicated um, I, process where the environment is not fully permissive for a complete EMT. So there is no fibroblast signal whatsoever? Not that we can see. And our, our data did not sample any mesenchymal cells or stromal okay. cells. Or and anything. a quick second question. Yeah. Is the analysis deep enough that you can see specific T cell clonotypes, specific TCR beta sequences? Almost. Yeah, we can talk about the immune cell. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And 
Hi, Esther. That was a great talk. Thanks. Um, I have a sort of bioinformatics question for you about the immune response gene. So I wondered what cutoffs you were using for the differentially expressed genes, because many of the immune response genes are expressed at practically no level, and they go from practically none to very, very little, and they still come out in the differentially expressed gene list as a result. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered whether you had any comments on that about where you were cutting off uh, your lower level of stress. Yeah, so I think for most of the data I presented here, we used an FDR of 0 0.05 with a log full change of 0 0.25. And then obviously for single cell, especially with subpopulations that are a little bit more rare or imbalanced between the two um, comparative populations, you have to make those sacrifices. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, it's a wonderful talk, clearly out of my comfort zone here, but is there any uh, signature in the bronchial uh, single cell analysis about those uh, squamous cells? Can you see those in the intrapulmonary airways? So the bronchial data set that I did the comparative analysis, Johnny's yeah. data set, um, that was not included in that. Okay. Um, I, but we've spent quite a lot of time. We developed this one stellar immunofluorescence marker if anybody's interested in to pick up these areas of squamation that you can kind of line up very nicely with corresponding H&E. And most definitely they're there, um, but I'll be the first one to admit that there is some propensity of having more squamous areas within the sinonasal passages. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So there's a question from online. Um, since you're seeing more KRT13 positive cells, do you think these are similar to the HILHOG cells, the HILOG cells? And, and, and I think that's that's sort of where my a little bit more agnostic um, I view and sort of more gentle treatment of what these squamous cells may be, because um, they're most definitely seen in areas of completely normal anatomy as well. Um, we normally do see keratin-13 as a marker, but what we're also seeing is a very robust expression of genes related to inflammation and senescence, which separate the healthy versus CF populations of these squamous cells, although I'll be the first one to admit that we have very few um, healthy squamous cells. So. You know, obviously, we're trying to make the best of the small data set that we have. Could I just ask about your sampling method? Uh -huh. Do you do it under direct visualization using an endoscope, sinus endoscope? Yeah, so we put an otoscope in there to kind of visualize the anatomy, the visualize the path, um, make sure that we're not hitting any polyps, and then the operator sort of does a very um, stereotyped um, for in and out kind of tromboning motion. Specifically the inferior turbinate. Of the inferior the turbinate, um, sort of swirling it around. So one thing that we do have and everybody has with respect to nasal brushing is that I think it's a very consistent and faithful way of hitting the same bit of anatomy. It's like a COVID test with a toothbrush. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm going to stay up here and welcome Kavisha Aurora from um, Cedar Sinai, who's going to be our next presenter. All right, so let me just get out this, and you just hit start whenever you're ready. And then you can either do this or you can do that. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's pretty cold for Arizona. <laughs> so I, I'm Kavisha Arora, and I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Dr. Lee here. So today I'm going to be talking about, uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, uh, Esther and uh, Esther for inviting us and uh, giving this opportunity to share our work. So the topic of my presentation today is single cell functional profiling of CFTR in primary and IPSC derived CF relevant epithelia. 
you have no disclosures. I know I, most of you are not familiar, familiar with cystic fibrosis here, so I'm just talking, going to talk about uh, cystic fibrosis. So it's a multiple organ disorder, of course, and uh, which primarily affects the lung. There is thick mucus infection, inflammation, bronchostasis, lung parenchyma loss, progressive lung function decline, and ultimate failure that leads to mortality in these patients. So it's a multiple organ disorder. So there is a serious uh, GI manifestation in CF, uh, pancreatic insufficiency, and C complication of CFRD that develops later in life. And there is also meconium ileus, chronic constipation, DIOS, and GRD. And these complications are becoming very predominant as CF patients have started to live longer. There's also CFLD, infertility, and some of the unpublished work from our lab is indicated is indicating that there is also middle ear disease in CF. There is also a complication of cancer in CF. So it's a multiple organ disorder. So that's why it is very critical that we study these organs for an effective CF therapy. Plus, there is an additional complication of mutations in cystic fibrosis. There are six classes, and uh, they produce different defects. And these affect the individuals differently. About 11% they have class 1 mutation, most have class 2 mutation, and 5% have class 3 mutation. And then there are hundreds and thousands of others, uh, rare and atypical mutations that also need to be addressed. So there is manifestation of organs, and then there are so many mutations. So there's a lot of phenotypic heterogeneity in CF patients that needs to be addressed. Of course, we are all aware of these very highly effective modulated therapy, which are categorized into correctors, potentiators, and amplifiers. So the Clydeco was the first one that was approved in 2012. Then it was Orcambi, and the latest one is the Trikafta, or the ETI, that, uh, that is uh, to address class two CFD mutation with at least one copy of F508. And then there's eventually a hope of having a therapy for all because the modulators are very mutation specific. So with the hope, with the hope of genetic based therapies, we can address every CF mutation. So there's an approach of mRNA delivery in which the normal copy of CFTR would be delivered and there's gene delivery and there's CRISPR based gene editing that has been, the, and these have, efforts have been going on uh, for the CF therapy. So as I discussed earlier that there are different organs involved, so we need different model systems to study cystic fibrosis. So airway, intestine, and pancreas, these are the major organs affected in CF. So we have all these beautiful model systems that we can use to study cystic fibrosis. So airway, we have the ALI cultures, the nasal, the nasal cells, and the primary organoids, and then we have the iPSC-derived airway epithelial cells. That's a beautiful work by uh, Ben Hawkins and Dr. Daryl Collins lab that they have generated these nice protocols to generate airway epithelial cells from the iPSCs. And then we have the intestinal models in which we can use the intestinal organoids and the HIOs, which are derived from iPSCs, and these iPSCs uh, derived HIOs can also be implanted into the mouse kidney to generate in vivo HIOs, which have we, we have used in the past. And then these HIOs can also be used to generate EPCAM positive cells and then put on the transfers for uh, CFD specific biases. And then there's pancreas. So the, it is very critical to have a model system for pancreas because uh, which is dependent on iPSCs because there's due to the non-availability of pancreatic tissue in most cases. But we do get, uh, like if we do get rarely the primary pancreatic ducts uh, from the CF patients. And we have also developed a protocol to generate iPSCs derived pancreatic ductal organoids, which I will share later. And these are the standard assays. I don't need to talk about these, but uh, the reason I mentioned that, that I will be talking a, a whole a lot about uh, whole cell uh, patch clamping, which I will be using uh, in these studies. So single cell transcriptomics has really opened up a new era in cystic fibrosis in which we are looking at single cell level to address CF therapeutics. 
So this was a seminal study that was published five years ba uh, back that by two independent groups that identified Fox I1 positive cells, inocytes, as the CFJ heart cells. So this and this really helps segregate the CFJ expression profile based on these uh, on the single cell uh, at the single cell level. So there are these areas, epithelial cell types, basal cells, secretory cells, ciliated cells, inocytes, neuroendocrine, and Fox and four positive cell populations. And if you look at the uh, CFT expression levels, the inocytes have the highest expression followed by secretory cells, basal cells, and then the ciliated cells, which uh, contribute very minimally to the CFT expression. And if you look at the uh, single UMAP profile here, that uh, inocytes again are expressing high amounts of CFGR, which is uh, no stranger to us. And then the secretory cells and the ciliated cells are not expressing much of the CFGR protein uh, transcriptomics. And this was a very nice study uh, by uh, it's a multi consortium study. Uh, and then they looked at the single cell profile from the healthy donors and the uh, CF, and then they found that there are two major uh, abrasions that are present in cystic fibrosis area cells. First, there is an expanded ciliated cell program, and there is a depletion in mitotic and metabolic functions of basal cells, which signifies defects in injury repair and regeneration in CF. So the question is, that when we have all these cell profiles, which cells are most important? So I kind of borrowed some of the slides from Ann Kelly here. So this is the study that uh, that was published recently, in which they looked at the pop, uh, the airway subpopulations in the large airway epithelium and the small airway epithelium, and they found that the secretory cells are the most predominant ones, and the inocytes they are contribute they are less than one percent. So if you look at the total CFTR contribution, the security and the basal cells, they contribute to more than 80% of the CFTR positive cells. While inocytes are close to 5% and ciliated cells are 5%. And if you look at this uh, from the fresh uh, nasal brushings, that uh, bronchial brushings, they looked at that the secreted cells, again, are the most predominant one with why the ciliated cells do not contribute at all here to the CFTR expression. And really, the functional state of the CFTR is not different between the large airway and the small airways, or the CFTR inhibitor-specific response, while the inocytes are uh, much less in number in the small airways compared to the large airways, which suggests that the inocytes are actually not contributing much to the CFTR function here. So this is again a debate uh, that which cell, cell type is most important. And uh, so this study came up and then it has really redefined the contribution of inocytes in CF airway disease. And this is a very elegant study by John Engelhardt group in which they generated this Fox I1 uh, knockout ferrets and looked at the CFJ functional profile and airway fluid properties in which they showed that there's a decrease in CFJ function when there is uh, Fox I, in the Fox I one knockout ferrets, and also the airway fluid properties are significantly altered. For example, they are more acidic. There is more viscosity, and there is uh, delayed micellar clearance in the Fox I knockout ferrets, suggesting that ionocytes do have a role in regulating the uh, safety of function and airway fluid properties in the airways, especially the large airways. And this study elegantly identified that there are three subtypes of inocytes, so not just one inocyte, and these have very distinct roles. So again, the question remains that which cell type is very important for gene editing in CF? Is it inocytes, base cells, secretory cells? And rare and restricted presence of inocytes raises the question of if there are atypical roles for the cell type other than CFTR dependent chloride secretion or absorption, as is recently reported by Iowa group, that inocytes indeed can mediate uh, chloride absorption similar to the sweat glands, which is very interesting. 
and why inocytes are so high in CFJ expression, and what determines the segregation for expression of CFJ, why there are so much uh, very high CFTR and so low CFTR populations there. And how does the CFTR transcriptome translate to protein and function? Because it is estimated there's about 30% correlation between the transcriptomics and to what you see functionally. So do we have to look beyond the transcriptomics? That is the basic question that we also need to address. Because what is being believed now that CFTR needs to be corrected more to see an effective, more effective CF therapy. There is still problems in the lung, the infection is still there. So there needs to be more correction that is needed to effectively cure CF. So we are taking of this uh, a unique approach called path sequencing. So which was, uh, so path sequencing is an approach that combines whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology with subsequent mRNA sequencing. And this technique is very well standardized with neurons. And we are, what we are trying to look here is with the airway cells. So it is precisely the precision medicine because we are looking at the function of a single cell and associating that function of the single cell to the transcriptomics. So using this technique, we can identify what is the epithelial subtype that we are measuring the function in, and what is the molecular signature that is associated with different functional states of CFTR. So first I would just start with how we process this sample. So we get the lung tissue, uh, we uh, isolate the epkin positive cells from these lung tissues. For example, here we have the CF lung with W1282X in N1303K CFTR mutation. So, and then we directly use these cells to perform patch clamping. So they are not seeing any cultural condition here, the long-term cultural conditions. So what we found here that this uh, epkin positive cells are responding very well to ETI therapy or trikafta. And that has been uh, shown previously by us in the clinical setting that ETI can be a, a therapy of benefit to N1303K CFTR mutation. As you can see here in our recent publication, that uh, when this patient was put on trikafta, there was significant improvement in the lung function. So sh showing this same uh, graph here, and just segregating all the cells that we are seeing the function for in the trikafta treatment. Here, as you can see, these cells are having different levels of function. So this is just performed by Dr. Lee, who, and you know how precise the patch clamping technique is. And there's no interpersonal uh, variability here. So what we want to see, how this cell is different from this cell. And it is not that Dr. Lee was more nice to this cell versus this cell. So these are the two uh, different experiments from the same sample, the fresh samples, and we do see a lot of functional variability here. And I would like to emphasize when we use these cells under ALI culture and perform similar patch clamping studies, we are not seeing a similar pattern of function. So it means there's also significant differences in a fresh sample versus the ALI cultured samples that we have to emphasize. Of note, when we also did uh, Using Chame experiments for the ALI culture samples, there was not a very significant trikafta response in these cells. So as you can see here, that ALI does something differently to these cells, and they may not very well recapitulate what's going on in vivo. So again, then when we have these different functional states of CFTR, so what we did, uh, that we just collect these cells in a glass pipette, just break the pipette into the, into the epidraft tube and send it for sequencing and perform a single cell transcriptomic. So when, as you can appreciate here, this is very pre preliminary data. And of course we have to do many, many more cells here, but I just want to show the feasibility of what's going on here. So as you can see, all these cells have very different transcriptional profile. And easily we can, uh, we can subdivide these cells based on the median value that 
we have a group one that has more than median value, group 10, two, which has close to the median value, and there is a group three of cells that is less than median value. So our goal is what's going on with this group one versus this group that differentiates these two different functional states of CFDR. And I just want to present this slide and show that all the cells that we patched here were the secretory cells. And of course, we are not going to hit any inocytes because they are less than 1%. So there is no way that we can do that. But within the secretory cells, is there any, is there further subpopulation that we can target CFTR function high versus CFTR function low? That's the question we are trying to address. So now I'm going to switch gear to another model system. Uh, I don't have the PATSIC data, but I just want to emphasize that the model system that we are using and whether we can apply a similar approach for the intestine. And this is, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, this is the androids. And, and we all know that they are very robust system for CFDR measuring CFDR dependent secretion. So if you have normal CFTR, you see a good expansion. Mutant CFTR, you don't see much expansion. And when you have an intervention, then you see a rescue of uh, secretion. So we also uh, use the organoids, uh, or the, we sometimes use the fresh samples to isolate APCAM positive cells and directly pad these cells. And then look at the CFTR function. And if you look at the single cell functional profile between these cells, of course the intestinal, intestinal cells have much lower function compared to the airway cells. But if you look at the, uh, if you uh, use a normalized scale, you can see there's not much variation in terms of CFTR function in the intestinal cell versus airway cells. Although there are some distinct uh, CFTR function high populations here too. And we have another model system, for example, the IPSC derived intestinal tissues that we can generate. And then these are also very robust system to look at CFTR function. So in case we need to uh, look at the GI function and, and the single cell specific intestinal function, then we can also use this model system. So as you can see here, these are the IPSC derived intestinal epithelial cells from F508 homozygous patient, which responded very well to the trikafta. So I'm now going to move to the last uh, model system, the pancreas. So this is, uh, so the diagram here shows that how we actually isolate the primary ductal organoids. The primary ductal organoids are important because that's are the site where the CFTR is most expressed in the human body for CFTR. So we get this pancreatic tissue and then we can isolate the ducts from these pancreatic tissues. As you can see here, this is a nice duct. And then we do just EDT dissociation and generate the organoids, which we call pancreatic ductal organoids. And again, we can look at the single cell level function in these pancreatic ductal organoids. And as you can appreciate here, uh, which I will show you again in the next slide, that these express very good amount of CFTR function. And interestingly, when you process these cells, the next day there was a significant decline in the CFTF function. So there's something going on here, and we don't know why, that why CFTF function is, lo is getting lost over time. So what it needs to be done to go back to this state? So that's an important question that we can also look into. So if you compare, again, the functional profile at the single cell level across these different organs, so we can also appreciate here, there's a lot of uh, functional variation in the pancreatic ductal epithelial cells. So both pancreatic ductal cells and the airway cells have a lot of functional heterogeneity compared to the intestinal cells. And another model system that we are currently working on is the IPSC derived pancreatic ductal organoids. And sometimes this is very important, like we get a lot of these pancreatitis patients and CFTR is a predominant risk factor uh, in, in the development of pancreatitis. And some of uh, these pancreatitis patients, because they have CF mutations, they have a little bit of the CF-like phenotype. For example, this is a patient uh, which we call ICP-9. She has these mutations, M40, 
470V, very atypical mutation. And she has ductal obstruction in the pancreas and some of the CF-like lung symptoms, but there is no confirmed diagnosis of CF based on the sweat measures. So what we did was get IBSC from this patient and followed an extensive protocol. Like to remind you that we're out of time? I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I would move on for uh, fast forward. So just uh, just to just to summarize this slide that uh, we found that this patient responded very well to the evac, evac after. So we generated the IPSC derived IPDO from control in the patient line, and this patient responded very well to the IVAC after therapy. So in conclusion, we have de demonstrated robust model systems, and we think that PATH-seq is an ideal approach for studying patient-derived cells, and which can be done in less than 14, 48 hours to unsee the impact of long-term artificial culturing and modeling. There are certain limitations, of course, there are limitations to this study that we need large sample size and there are patient specific differences in CF time function may exist and this can be overcome using IPSC derived epithelium. And also we are trying to optimize a better approach to perform patching. So I would like to acknowledge Dr. Narin and Dr. Lee who has done majority of the, all of the, not majority, all of the patch clump work here. And uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kavishim, for the interest of time so that we can finish the session um, in a timely manner. Um, we're going to skip the questions for now, but I'd like to encourage you to find um, Kavisha at the end of the session um, uh, to ask her about this wonderful technology and the results. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So last presentation uh, for this session is Dr. Wenji Yu, and he's going to talk about airway submucosal gland cell biology, physiology, and pathophysiology in cystic fibrosis. Welcome. Maybe in Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to share my research. I study airway stomach mucosal gland. I have no, uh, no things to disclosure. So my research focused on airway stomach mucosal gland. So it's a structure that localized in large airways of human lung that generate mucus to combat with foreign particles and the pathogens. And so here, two cell types localized in some mucosal gland that generate mucus. Uh, mucus cells produce mucins and serious cells producing antimicrobials, fluid, and ion. These two cell types generate mucus in gland, and in the help of myobacterial cell contraction, mucus will be released to the airway surface and involved in bacterial killing and the mucus transport. But in cystic fibrosis, because of CFTR mutations, uh, the fluid and ion secretion in the serious cells disrupted or impaired resulting in sticky mucus from gland in CF that will impair the bacterial kidney and uh, disrupt mucus transport as a result cause infection, inflammation, and the mucus obstruction. Mm. These two images are typical histology of some mucosal gland in non-CF and CF patients. What we can see apparently in this uh, CF is the enlarged gland lumen filled with mucus inside. Actually, Milk uh, gland phenotype is a typical feature of CF9 disease, including submucosal gland dilation, hypertrophy, and hyperplasia. And the question I initially asked uh, is 
where the safe thermal gland normally formed at birth before CF9 disease. And to address this question, I study thermal gland in pigs. The size and anatomy, cell biology, and the physiology of thermal gland uh, of pig nun closely resemble those of human nun. In addition, pig uh, has a lot of thermal gland in the nun. Um, most importantly, CFTR local pigs develop CF9 disease, as our previous uh, studies showed. So uh, this allowed me to focus on the early stage of CF9 disease and uh, study the function of some gland. But the first task I need to do is uh, to access some mucosal gland because some mucosal gland are uh, embedded inside of the airway as this arrow uh, has pointed. Uh, I find a way to peel the ABC layer away from beneath smooth muscle and the uh, cartilage layers, and then expose the some mucosal gland these structures are all some mucosal gland under the airway surface, as you can see here, a tons of structures that generate mucus. Mm. I um, applied uh, the, uh, individual gland dissection using a blade to isolate individual some mucosal gland and prepare single cells for iron sequencing. So here is the summary of the single cell iron sequencing data. I have uh, cells from both Y type and the CF some mucosal gland at birth. So I the data set including CRV cells, mucus cells, and the myofibrillary cells. cells. These three cell types are major cell type in some mucosal gland. In addition, I have basal cells and the cilia cells that could potentially from the gland duct or airway surface epithelial cells. Of course, I have non epithelial cells including immune cells, endothelial cells, and the fibroblasts that provide a uh, uh, surrounding tissue for the gland. The first thing uh, when I got this single cell ionic data is. I want to ask whether there are difference between CF and non-CF submucosal gland at birth. Uh, I look at a cell type that uh, makes gland in tissue and the cell type proportion between white and the CF are similar, suggests no cell type proportion difference between these two groups. In addition, I also look at the gene expression profile between white and the CF. Um, here I show this graph is uh, the example in the series cells. The Wakana plot show at the XX is the full change at the log scale. The large number suggests uh, higher differentially expressed genes. The YX is the negative log 10 full discovery rate. A higher value suggests a more significant difference. What we can see here is only three differentially expressed genes between white and CF. That's also the case for another cell type, mucus cells in some mucus gland. Only one gene popped out. I also confirmed uh, this data using qPCR, tried to confirm them and uh, found barely uh, difference between Y-type and CF. So conclude that CF gland transcripts are similar with Y-type at birth. Uh, a surprising finding about this single cell and sick data is finding a rare cell cluster at this corner based on the gene expression profile. This is pulmonary neuroendocrine cells. So this is a very surprising finding because uh, PNACs are uh, rare epithelial cells only report to be in the airway surface. They are chemosensory cells uh, that generate neurotransmitters and the neuropeptides in response to external challenges like mechanical force or allergies. So first I confirm this uh, finding uh, by in, uh, immunostaining of PNAC marker SATO Kevin 20 in green in the uh, pig submucosal gland tissue, all these rare tissues are gland, and truly found PNX localized in gland. In addition, I also confirmed uh, this finding in human submucosal gland. What we can see, this arrow has point the uh, PNX cells in submucosal gland duct and gland acinus. So this uh, concludes that in pig and the human gland, they are PNX. The next question is, are these glandular PNX chemosensory cells? Mm, consist uh, with this hypothesis, I found a class of G protein coupled receptors here uh, because G protein coupled receptors are chemosensory receptors. Uh, I found all, a lot of G protein coupled receptors specifically expressed in PNAX. My current research focused on succinate receptor 1 because it's highly expressed uh, in the PNAX with the lowest force discovery rate, suggests the specificity about this receptor in PNAX. Uh, most interesting, a previous paper from Dr. Prince Lev showed that in CF uh, airway liquid, uh, there are 
more succinate comparing to healthy controls. Succinate is a ligand of the succinate receptor when suggests potential physiological function about this receptor in CF. Mm. I first confirmed the localization of succinate receptor way in PNX using insulin and uh, immunostaining uh, targeted succinate receptor way and found uh, this receptor is apically uh, expressed, uh, localized in PNX. Uh, the next question is how does this glandular PNX can sense succinate which is localized at a surface? The distance between these two uh, more than 200 micro, uh, micrometer, which is uh, very far away at the molecular level. So I hypothesize that a surface molecule can diffuse down to the gland through the duct or a chemical gradient. To test this hypothesis, I performed a, a diffusion uh, assay, which apply fluorescent label lectin to the airway surface of the peak trachea and allow like 10 minutes of molecular uh, diffusion and the incubation, what we can see the surface uh, cells, including cilia or mucus, are uh, labeled with this lectin. Uh, in 10 minutes of the diffusion, we can see surface molecule can diffuse down to the gland and stain the cell membrane or the mucus inside of this gland. Since succinate uh, is far smaller than the lectin, uh, it suggests that succinate can also diffuse into the gland. So the next key question I asked is, uh, what's the response if we challenge this gland with succinate? So this is, uh, I performed the gland live imaging. And these structures are also mucosal gland labeled with fluorescent labeled uh, epicane antibody. What we can see before I add succinate, no changed. But when I add succinate, we can see a gland contraction featured as enlarged distance between these two submucosal glands and the reduced size of this gland. Uh, the graph is the summary of this uh, uh, essay. The yx is the ratio of area after treatment. Anything below one suggests gland contraction. What we can see here, succinate treatment can cause gland contraction. And uh, EJ40, a uh, succinate receptor when specific antagonist can abolish the effect. Uh, this data uh, suggests that a succinate can cause gland contraction while succinate receptor one. So the next question is how does succinate can activate PNAX? Based on uh, studies of succinate receptor one in some other cell type systems like uh, tough cell in intestine uh, uh, suggest that that might activate calcium concentration inside of PNAX. So I tested this hypothesis in PNAX-like cells. So uh, in this cell uh, system, they expressed succinate receptor when I performed calcium image uh, in this culture system. When I uh, add succinate, as you can see this arrowhead pointed cells, the concentration of calcium inside of these cells increased. Mm. And increased calcium concentration can promote the excitosis of neurotransmitter and neuropeptides uh, in PNX. Uh, for the case of glandular PNX, these three neural signals are the key elements for glandular PNX, including calcitonin gene-related peptide, serotonin, and ATP. And I apply these three signals to uh, live submucosal gland and try to do live imaging to see where which uh, signal can cause gland contraction. What we can see here, C uh, CGRP and serotonin didn't do anything uh, in a short period of time. But ATP uh, caused the gland contraction, which is similar to Kaboka, a positive control. So here uh, is the, the brief summary that uh, succinate can activate uh, PNAC to release ATP. So next question is, which, which cell type response to the ATP signal from PNAX. Mm, the cell type should have three criteria, at least here. First, they should have ATP receptors. In addition, they need to be close to PNAX because ATP is a short distance neurotransmitter. Uh, in addition, of course, the cell type need uh, contractile features that can facilitate cell contraction. Uh, to make the long story shorter, I um, think uh, myo epithelial cells is a good candidate because first they express alpha smooth muscle actin, the protein, and will 
and do like a contraction in response to calcium. In addition, these myo epithelial cells wrap around the submucosal gland, and in other systems, they can cause gland contraction. And most importantly, our single cell ion seq data show that uh, myo epithelial cells specifically express an ATP receptor, P2 YY receptor. I uh, challenge this uh, culture, the primary myo epithelial cells from newborn pigs with ATP. The calcium image showed that ATP can increase the concentration of calcium in these primary myo epithelial cells. And this response is ATP dose dependent. As we can see, when increase the dose of ATP, the response increased. And this response also uh, P2 Y1 receptor uh, dependent because when I add P2 Y1 receptor antagonist MRS2500, this response will be reduced or abolished. So this data conclude that ATP can activate myo epithelial uh, cell calcium concentration via P2 Y1 receptor. So the consequence is cause the uh, myo epithelial cell contraction. I performed a myo epithelial contraction as in culture system. So the YX is the ratio of total area of matched myo epithelial cells. I applied serotonin, CGRP, and ATP to this culture myo epithelial cells and only see ATP can cause myo epithelial contraction. So here is the summary of uh, this mechanism. I found uh, in some mucosal gland, there are PNX, and PNX express succinic receptor 1. It can sense external uh, molecules like inflammatory factor succinate. And succinate can increase the calcium concentration in PNEC and promote ATP release. And myo epithelial cells that wrap around some mucosal gland express P2Y1 receptor, a receptor for ATP, and cause calcium dependent myo epithelial contraction. This is important for milk ejection in some mucosal gland. And so the key question is why we care about it because this is a CF meeting. And I think uh, in our previous paper uh, in uh, pigs, uh, Linda Ostgard showed that in CF submucosal gland duct, there are mucus at this region. You can see the red signals are mucus for filled with the gland duct. And my hypothesis for glandular uh, pinac chemosensation depends on molecular diffuse to the gland through the duct. If this region is filled with uh, mucus, the diffusion might be uh, reduced or impaired. So I test this hypothesis using uh, by doing the diffusion assay. This time I have um, trachea from white type of pig and the CF pig, and these tissues are pretreated with mesoconium for mucus secretion. After like 10 minutes of mucus secretion, I washed the mesoconium away and allow uh, a recovery. So in white type, Presumably, the mucus will be released out to the uh, gland, but in CF, they might be uh, mucus uh, stuck at the duct of the gland. So, and this lactic migration also suggests that fluorescent signals can migrate down to the gland in white type, but in CF, we barely see the signal. So here is the summary uh, of this uh, migration data. What we can see compared to white type CF, uh, negative migrate less distance down to the gland, suggesting impaired uh, uh, molecular diffusion in CF group. So here, here is potential consequence. As I showed uh, before, uh, the succinate treatment can cause some of the gland uh, contraction. So the white of part is already shown, but for the CF, especially at this uh, colon, it's a little bit different. Succinate can uh, also, some succinate can cause a CF gland contraction, but it's far less compared to white type. And for some uh, peaks or glands, the contraction is almost abolished. So here is a brief summary about this data. Uh, ductal mucus accretion attenuates pinac dependent gland chemosensation and uh, contraction in CF. I think this might be one of our explanation why milk fills the CF gland lumen in patients because uh, uh, first is a uh, milk is sticky in CF in addition to that because milk block the path 
for molecule can diffuse down the gland. As a result, the contraction of CF sum of the gland is impaired or reduced. As a result, you can see more milk abstract in the acinaluma of the gland. So here is my last slide. I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Michael Welsh, and all the lab members from Welsh Lab, Sudhout Lab, and Zembla Lab. I would, last, I would like to thank the funding sources, including CF Foundation. Thank you. I would like to take questions. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so hi. Um, hi. So I work with sweat glands, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that your work is a really good example of how much more we can uh, learn with single cell if we're micro dissecting out uh, small structures. Um, I was wondering specifically though, uh, so ZG16B is one of the differentially expressed um, genes in the CF mm -hmm. pigs. So I was also seeing this gene uh, in, in my work and I was wondering if you've done any follow-up specifically mm. uh, on ZG16B. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. Actually, it's the only gene that differentially expressed between yeah, I read white type and yeah. CF. But I, I didn't do follow-up studies. So yeah. it would be great if you... Uh, I'd love if, to talk yeah, to you about yeah, that. Thank yeah. you. But that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great work. I just had a question on your methylcholine. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about chemosensing, it seems like bulk flow out of the gland should have been the first hypothesis. So I was a little surprised with your wild type with methylcholine that you still diffused against bulk flow. Is I mean, is that like a, a, a normal example or most of the time they're actually pushing everything out and nothing diffuses back at the because 10 minutes of methylcholine you swear yeah. everything is moving out at that point yeah so uh I, of course uh for this type of methylcholine i, I applied a low dose uh -huh. so i hope you know methylcholine will be washed away but i'm not sure whether this is a clean wash up because comparing to non methylcholine treat groups the distance is less. So I, I presume it must call might play a role here, but I tried like, I think it's 10, I think it's one macromolar or mesocolin is far less than we usually used for mucus secretion and exactly. gland contraction. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. David Hill from UNC, fantastic work. I think this shows a consistency across a lot of studies that show that the glands are clogged in CF. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, over the time scales that occurs, you know, are they gland within the first, are they clogged within the first few days after birth so that the gland would never truly contribute to CF pathophysiology or is it the lack of gland secretion that you think is contributing? And just a technical question, have you tried to do your diffusion assay with smaller molecular weight dextrans that could maybe penetrate even a tight hyperconcentrated mucus mesh? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, for the first question, I, I think mucus secretion so people talk about the basal mucus secretion from gland and the aggressively mucus secretion from gland. I think the clock, uh, the data Linda uh, starts sh uh, also got showed, and they we try to like stimulate mucus secretion, then look at mucus potential mucus clock in gland. But for how uh, what time point and uh, whether like several, after, several days after birth they are clogged in CF gland. I don't know. I personally didn't perform the experiment, but I speculate this is a eventually defect, accumulate. And, and the best way to look at this is you need aggressively st uh, stimulate the mucus secretion first to get an obvious difference. Now for the second question, I tried uh, small molecules because the, the lectin I use here, they can interact with mucus. They might, the mucus might prevent is diffused down to the gland duct. So I tried another uh, lipid-like uh, lipid uh, fluorescent uh, uh, molecules named like cell mask. And for that, they, they will uh, not interact with the mucus, but still they, they can interact with the cell membrane still. And for that type of experiment, I noticed they can migrate a little bit further down to the gland duct. For the dextrin, I also tried, but unfortunately dextrin, they uh, don't stick to the mucus or cell membrane. So during this uh, section pro, uh, preparing process, they wash it away. So I, I didn't see a signal. Yeah, but it's a good question. Yeah. Clark from Missouri. That was a very exciting talk. I, 
uh, in the gut, the tough cells uh, monitor succinate and lumen that's produced by certain microbes and and parasites, and then they uh, uh, initiate an immune response against that area. Is mm -hmm. there any evidence that these cells also release uh, or in activate the immune system? Uh, yes, uh, I in most tough cells. Uh, they express, uh, the succinate express in uh, most tough, tough cells, but in the case of human and uh, um, pigs, uh, surprisingly, those uh, tough cells, they don't express succinate receptor 1. And uh, actually, it's another cell type, so it's PNAC cells express. So I don't know why evolution, you know, put the same uh, chemosensory receptor to different cell types, but that would be a very interesting question to address and to compare the species difference between mouse and human pigs, but they are different. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Last question. Thank you. So now, when you analyze your single cell RNA sequencing data, have you ever seen ionocytes on some microscope gland samples? And just wondering, because a couple also can stimulate the uh, contraction, and just thinking if that's due to the ionocytes, not just uh, other cell types. Yeah, so I, I think that's our initial goal. I try to find ionocytes in some microscope gland. So actually, the single cell RNA sequencing data I showed, I have like more than uh, 7,000 epithelial cells from some the gland. I only, I only found two ionocytes. So they are too rare to be classed in individual class. And I performed like immunostaining about ionocyte markers and they localized in the dark of some of the gland. So comparing to the ferret and uh, maybe human data, they could be potentially less ionocyte in peak some of the gland, especially at birth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.